So um, next up is Rafael Gomez Bombarelli. Um, Rafa and I spent many, many hours on uh, Zoom calls in 2020. And uh, when I saw him in person today, we realized that we actually had never met in person before. So I guess even though we've only <laughs> lived 20, uh, 20 minutes apart, work 20 minutes apart. So Rafa is the Jeffrey Chia Assistant Professor at MIT's Department of Material Sciences and Engineering since 2018. His works aim to fuse machine learning and atomistic simulations for designing materials and their transformations. The title of his talk is Physics Informed Representation Learning for Therapeutics. And I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Eric. It was truly a pleasure to, to meet you in person. <laughs> it's been truly a pleasure to be here today. Uh, and I'm very sad to be the person between you and an open bar outside, so I'll do my best to, to make your minutes worth it. Um, I'll also have the advantage of being the last one to speak today, maybe, so I can, I can have the last word on generative models. And uh, I don't think they're working for molecules, uh, and it's up to us. This is like calling out CelebNet, the neural network that gives you celebrity faces, and people come out wearing you know, pirate hats and have crooked teeth. <laughs> and are sort of insane, or maybe they're sort of green reptilians, right? Like, so clearly, we're getting re green reptilians out of, uh, out of CelebNet, uh, so we're doing something wrong for molecules, but it's definitely working for biologics, right? Like there is, there is like a zillion companies have started in the last two, three years doing generative models for, uh, for biologics and peptides. We've got Wen Gong here in the first row who's making antibodies with generative models, and those things are working. So small molecules uh, will need to wait. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we're in this sort of, we try to be on this computational spectrum. We come from a world where we trust our simulations to be good oracles, maybe, maybe like the Schrodinger folks, right? We, uh, we trust our simulations to create raw data and create sort of ground truth from the bottom up. Uh, but they're typically too expensive, right? So we've got this continuum of, of phase space we want to be working in that goes from you know, we get to use all the physics, but that's expensive, and, and we only get back the physics we put in, to we have no physics whatsoever, uh, and we're working around, and we'll need a trillion tokens uh, to make this work, like uh, large language models. And in between, there is what folks call inductive biases, which is we already know rules, we already know laws, let's embed them in some way that, I, that we can, right? And, and this, on the, on the left-hand side here, and, and I won't be repeating myself from last week. I talked a lot about interatomic potentials when, when uh, Pat Walters was talking about active learning. Uh, this has a lot of physics in it. Uh, ANI, what he described about ANI, that's an interatomic potential, right? It has a lot of physics, a little bit of machine learning, and gives you a lot of value because it makes some quantum calculation that was expensive cheaper. Um, and, uh, and in between, there is sort of these ideas, for instance, multi-fidelity. This is the idea of mixing two fidelities, one that you trust less, but is cheap, and one that you trust more, but is more expensive, which is exactly the thing we heard about docking and FEP, right? Those two things should work together. You get millions of one, tens of the other. How do you make those two things work together? And in all those places, we, we want to use these tools for discovery. We do mostly, or a lot of material science, uh, uh, but when we can, we come in into the, into the drug discovery uh, and molecular space. So for instance, one thing we, we really like about deep learning is the ability to learn from structure. We can look at atoms, we can look at bonds. There is this machine learning architecture that called graph convolutional neural networks or message passing neural networks. If you've heard about Kemprop, uh, you can ask uh, <laughs> Wen Gong here in the first row all your questions. Um, these are really good architectures that outdo classical fingerprints when you've got more than 1,000 to 5,000 data points. So if you have less than 1,000 data points, you're very unlikely to make these tools work. But if you've got more than 10,000, they're surely going to work. And there is this sort of continuum in between. Um, and this is a tool that has really, really changed structure property predictions over molecules. And uh, this is what I was saying about multi-fidelity. I don't have a drug discovery example, but I have a, a UBB's property example where we mixed the low fidelity data that was simulations and the high fidelity data that was experiments. And it turns out we, we do much better uh, mixing the, the two predictions together. So we make a graph neural network that predicts what theory would have said, so you save yourself the theory too, and then another model that says, well, if theory would have said that, the experiment would have been this other number. We've got these two models working together, uh, and each one sort of does some of the legwork of getting you from structure to experiment uh, using experiments and theory. And then you can see maybe on the right, this is the error that you get if you, do, if you train on really bad splits, 
which takes us back to, to Regina's talk at the beginning. If you train and, and, and test at random, everything looks amazing because everything is contaminated. And once one does the scaffold splits, all these tricks start making, uh, start being most useful, right? Because there is more actual inductive bias and more first principles information and more general rules that one was able to extract from the, from the embedding of the physics. Um, something we like to, and, and uh, has connected again with the Atom 3D and the conformer generation, is well, how much information is in 3D data uh, when you're doing a ligand-based discovery. So back in the, in the days of COVID, we got a lot of compute power uh, to try to answer this question for COVID. Um, and in the meantime, we didn't discover any COVID cures, but we learned a, lot, a bunch about uh, the interplay between 2D and 3D. Uh, so we made a tremendously large data set with uh, uh, 200,000 dr drugs that have been tested against the, uh, uh, the original SARS uh, OG. Uh, and then we made uh, 30 million conformers, so we folded them with the best physics we could afford, and we relabeled them with the best physics we could follow through with, and we made this big data set to try to, you know, A, enable folks to do 3D stuff on molecules, and B, ourselves test whether, you know, we can use deep learning and 3D information together in a way that's better than the graphs. And uh, we put together two classes of architectures, one that has sort of your traditional message passing, and has 3D on top of them, and another one that takes that and adds ensembles on conformers on top of that, right? Because a molecule is not just a single 3D. Maybe the, the phase space that it gets to explore has extra information than the single conformer that you pick. And then uh, I won't sort of get into the, all the combinations that we tried, but it turns out the, if you've got more than 100,000 data points, your prediction is implicitly in learning to fold the molecule anyway. So it turns out that the 3D didn't really help for us once you're in a sort of 100,000 data point space. It does help with transfer learning. Um, so you can see the height of the curves. This task involves some transfer learning, and this task involves some transfer learning. So we do see performance increases uh, when we do transfer learning to lower data tasks. But in the raw task of looking at these 100,000 SARS uh, inhibitors, the 3D didn't, didn't really bring much, uh, which we uh, did check with. That's how you uh, project the, the distances on the, on the uh, edges between the nodes. And then blowing it up a little bit on, on biologics. This is a place where we've done, uh, we've played around with, with uh, biologics with Brad Pantelute's lab. This is the, the grad student. He's about to get his PhD MBA. He's on the market right now. Uh, so uh, this could be a, a good chance for folks to, to go hire him. Um, we ended up in the, trying to solve a cell penetrating peptide problem where, you know, nuclear therapeutics are great. Everybody's excited. This was PMOs. We are a little bit out of fashion these days. Uh, this is in particular sort of the same thing that's behind Exondis 51, which has sort of bad, uh, um, poor ability to reach its target. It's, it's sort of a hard uh, therapeutic to make work. Um, so we set up, in collaboration with uh, Penteluter's lab, ability to make peptides on demand, uh, a machine learning campaign to see if we can make better cell penetrating peptides than, uh, than what they had done by hand. Uh, they had made the library. This is tremendous space. This is genuinely 10 to the 20. So in molecules, small molecules is always, well, they're not really makeable. We're sampling the wrong distribution. I don't know. But pretty much all peptides are valid, right? There's no really rules about, you know, some of them will precipitate maybe, but in general, this is really smooth space for optimization. So these tools really shine over here. So in this particular example, right, we had a, a GRFP fluorescence assay that would measure the ability of a peptide to deliver a payload into the, into the cell, a PMO, a, a polymorpholino oligonucleotide payload. Uh, a very exhaustive sort of grid-like database had been put together before we came on uh, with 700 entries. So we trained a model and we threw everything we could in terms of inductive biases to this model, right? We tried to do well. It's a sequence, so we're gonna use 1D convolutions that aggregate local environments. We know the monomers vary over some chemistry, so we're gonna use chemical fingerprints for embedding the monomers. That way we get to move around in chemical space because this is it's a chemical synthesizer, meaning we're not bound by natural amino acids. We can put in unnatural amino acids, so we need a representation that can take unnatural amino acids. So we put all of that together. Uh, we ended up with some horrible, I don't have it here, 
which is, I think it's good, an objective function of what this peptide should have, which was great potency, which we're predicting with this neural network, but also few arginines, because we already know arginines are gonna be toxic, and then we kind of wanna make it short, because you know, we don't wanna be using the synthesizer for hours and hours, so we wanna make it short, and we ended up with some objective function uh, that put all of this together, but wasn't uh, that that's uh, beautifully appealing. So uh, I'm, I'm keen to learn more about the multi-objective optimization, so we don't need to mix them all by hand. But the, the, um, we did about 15 predictions. People looked at them, but they didn't really sort of apply any filters because there's really no human intuition at this point. These are peptides, some of them are 40 long, some of them are 60 long. There's not really an intuition about what's going to work and what not. So pretty much the experimentalists took the 15 and, and ran with them. Uh, and you can see them right there. So this is our all the, these are all the uh, predictions we made. This is a, uh, a negative that we did on purpose. So this is a, a true negative. And then all the predictions except the negative were uh, higher in performance than uh, uh, maybe the you know, top 99% uh, in the training data, right? So this really learned. It really learned some chemistry. It was so, somewhat in pet interpretable because we can run the neural network backwards and look at what pieces of the peptide matter to the prediction, and it turns out the, the unnatural amino acid was the piece that, was the piece that really mattered. It was uh, really sensitive to long alkyl chains at the end of the peptide, which is what you can see sort of in this. This is illuminating the bits in the fingerprint and the position in the peptide, so there is sort of certain regions that would highlight. And it was possible to bring out some chemistry, some hypothesis. It's not an, as interpretable as people wanted in, in 2016, 2017, but it's interpretable enough for, for A-B hypothesis testing, which is, I think, what people really expect these days. And then anything that's over peptides, so for instance, these folks record every synthesis they make, meaning that we can also get to do a, a machine learning over synthesis of these peptides, not just over, over performance. Um, this was only for sequences. Uh, sequences are exciting. There's lots of biologics to, to do with sequences, but uh, they're not all possible polymers, and especially if you start interplaying artificial and natural chemistries, there's a lot more topologies than just straight sequences. You know? uh, so we were interested in, in coming out with a representation that was robust not only to a natural I mean, uh, monomers, but to non-linear topologies, right? How do we deal with branches? How do we deal with bottle brush uh, uh, topologies? So we essentially generalized the idea of this message passing, the graphs. Now we're not making a graph of the monomer, we're making a graph of the polymer, and every node is a monomer. The idea sort of seems uh, um, pretty uh, straightforward, and then we can sort of represent, you know, uh, a, a polymer, a complex polymer, as a graph of uh, each of the monomer chemistries, and if there is multiple binding modes, then we can also assign binding modes to the edges and say, well, this is a peptide bond, this is a glycosidic bond, and we can sort of featureize any uh, biopolymer or uh, uh, artificial polymer uh, topology to, to a representation, and it lets us do unsupervised learning, so we can measure distance uh, between this polymer and that polymer, both in chemistry and in topology, and uh, this very early enrichment, this one worked really well for classifying the um, immune response of glycans, but that turned out to be very, uh, very easy because the model, when we look at what it really cared about, it really identified that silos that is not made by humans is pretty monogenic, right? So it quickly went to, well, if you've got non-human gl uh, glucids, you're not gonna be, you're gonna be monogenic. But, but in general, we were able to train a model and interrogate what was uh, driving its decision making. And then if I've got time, sorry, I don't have a, a, a watch. I'll, I'll introduce one more that has a bunch more physics and I think sex well because I don't need to introduce molecular dynamics now because a, a couple of people have. Uh, but I would say molecular dynamics looks at the world one femtosecond at a time. Maybe three or four if you're re getting sort of really effective and, and whatever. So your whole view of the world takes one femtosecond steps to see these millisecond events. That's, that's kind of brutal. Um, so plus uh, the, you know, the scale, the amount of atoms you can look at, it is uh, also limited, and, and one needs to understand how these uh, atoms interact. So this is what we heard earlier about the uh, ANI, the atom 3D, it's, it's again in this. It's a really fast and accurate way to quantify the interaction between atoms. Um, and something we've cared a lot in the last few years is, is you know, how do we avoid these two things? How do we 
reduce the number of atoms we need to worry, and how do we fast forward in time um, when we do molecular dynamic simulations? And the answer to that is, is something that's called coarse graining, has existed for, for decades. The thermodynamics of how it should work are pretty well understood, and it turns out it involves mostly things that look like machine learning. It involves dimensionality reduction, where you take a molecule and you, know, you lump a bunch of atoms together and you say, well, you guys now move collectively. You're one bit. All these guys should be one bit. Which atoms should be in which bit? That's a learnable task. Uh, how do these beads interact in a way that represents the thermodynamics of this original molecule? Well, that's a learnable task. You need, how, you know, you need a represent a, a data of how these atoms were interacting and then compress it and relearn it on the interactions between these reduced representations. And can I get this uh, full resolution data back from my coarse grain? That's called back mapping, right? Well, this is a generative problem. Right? I've got some information that went away when I compress my data, and I want to take it back. So it turns out all these pieces can be learned. This is, this is showing the learning process for which atoms which should go into which bits. In proteins, this is kind of trivial. It's the alpha carbon. We're done. OK. Um, in, in artificial polymers, it could get trickier. Um, and if anyone knows Martini, which is the traditional way of coarse grain in proteins, it doesn't work like this. It has this kind of arbitrary bits where you know these two atoms go together in this one bit. So it was made by hand, and it's a lot more complicated than, than the alpha carbon. But in general, it, it can be learned uh, end to end. Uh, and then this is something that came out uh, earlier this year from the group. It's uh, a lot of models that talk to one another. But uh, uh, in my last 30 seconds or whatever, uh, I will just show you some examples of how it's able to uh, generate full resolution data from highly coarse grain. And maybe, uh, this one's better. Uh, so this is how people traditionally do back mapping in proteins from the alpha carbon with something called modeler, which has some rules and some force field. Um, and this is how the neural network brings back all the atoms for, from uh, coarse graining. Uh, so you can see the, the neural network is a little bit better. For some of them, it's much, much, much better. And it's also faster. Oh, I clipped the, the scale. I apologize. This is RMSD. This is the distance. Uh, and this is how long it takes. So we, sort of kind of, we do it slightly better at a fraction of the time in blowing up atoms from the alpha carbon positions. In case anybody is curious, alpha fall only falls the alpha carbons. So you still don't get the full chain back. You need to figure out how to get the full chain back. Well, you know, this is one way to get the full chain back. Uh, and if you train it on data from molecular dynamics, it will give you thermalized chains, not zero temperature chains, but thermalized chains that represent the thermodynamic distribution of the, of the original data. And with this, I will close up saying that, you know, we're in this space where we like to do engineering when the tools are there and try to get sort of, you know, we, we want to make things that are useful. And, and sometimes when the tools are not there, we try to make them uh, to, to select few places where, where what's out there just, just doesn't quite work yet. Uh, so I'll, I'll thank the team and our, uh, our generous sponsors for this. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Um, we have a time for a couple of questions. So if anybody wants to come up to the microphone or, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is a really cool talk. I really was excited by the peptide uh, work that you showed. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because you know, you, you trained on a lot of cell penetrating peptide data. And I was wondering if any of the representation that you were able to extract from that training um, can, uh, extends to other peptide functionalities like binding or other um, properties other than cell penetration. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so we haven't tried to transfer them. We don't have enough. We've, uh, I would say, We've had very bad luck with pre-trained protein embeddings. So you know we're, we're doing more stuff on proteomics uh, with, with a student that just started. We try um, uh, George's chairs, uh, Unirep. We try Unirep. It's worse than random. It's more than one hot. We, so we've, we, don't, we haven't had luck with pre-trained protein representations by anybody else. But our own, our own haven't transferred either. And that's because cell penetration is there's a lot of physical chemistry in it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a very mechanical, materially phenomenon. And you're not really sort of see this sort of high quality recognition event, like maybe antibody banding is, is a very sort of high quality, highly selective recognition, whereas CPPs act more through physical chemistry. So I think the embeddings we learn are physical chemistry embeddings, but they're not uh, 
protein interaction embeddings. How about using like a more chemical, like a chemical representation, which you were talking about alluding to, do you think that would work better for peptides than uh, say a language model of protein sequences? I wonder if there's a way, so in our case, it really helped us to hybridize this thing. So it, it was kind of a language model, but every token, instead of being a one whole encoding of the token, it was a more semantic encoding of the token. In this particular case, fingerprints that have existed for a long time and really capture local chemistry. And that way sort of, the, the specific example was the, the amino acid that made things run was amino hexanoic acid, which has this very long alkyl chain. And when we, so you couldn't put that into a, into a traditional language model because you don't have the token for, for that guy. But it's just a token for amino, a token for acid, and then a bunch of alkyl tokens that maybe grabs on from other parts of the representation. So yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Rafa? All right, great, thank you Rafa. Thank you.